All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for the Surviving the Fire Service Together talk with Stephen Sandy Khan and uh, making time to join the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative family for this monthly discussion. I uh, would like to say that the content of this presentation is proprietary and confidential information of the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative. It is not intended to be distributed by any party without the written consent of the collaborative. Attendees should, not, should note that the educational component of this session is being recorded and will be published on the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative's YouTube page. To maintain complete confidentiality, an announcement will be made before the recording begins and only the presenter will be identified during the recording. Therefore, to ensure anonymity, all attendees are asked to mute their microphone until an announcement is made that the recording is complete. Presentations are intended for educational purposes only and do not replace independent professional judgment. The ideas expressed in this presentation are the professional opinion of the presenter and do not necessarily represent um, those of the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative or its constituents. Before acting on any in the information presented, attendees should consider the appropriateness of the information as it pertains to their individual situation and seek independent professional advice should any concerns arise. If you or anyone you know are in what is believed or perceived to be a situation that is or may become harmful, please reach out to the National Domestic Violence Hotline via phone at 1-800-799-SAFE 1-800-799-7233 or through their website, uh, thehotline.org or dial 911 in the event of an emergency. So on behalf of myself, uh, Mark, my co-chair and the collaborative, Stephen Sandy Khan, thank you so much for being with us this evening and sharing your story. I'm going to pass you the mic and uh, take us away. Okay, well, uh, Michelle, uh, the state of Florida, um, and uh, the Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative, thank you for inviting us and including us in your, in your program. Uh, we, we, we met up with you a couple months back. We've been here every month since and really enjoy what you're doing. Um, it's something that we can probably steal from you uh, up here in Ohio. We're going to steal the concept and probably do something like that up here. Um, so with that, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You've been a joy to talk to. Um, and I think you, you guys have a very successful platform. I'm looking forward to it growing more. So I assume I can go ahead and share the screen. And so we do have a PowerPoint program. We both do medical lectures a lot. Um, uh, we do PowerPoint. It's not death by PowerPoint though, I promise. So let's, uh, I'll see if I can't do this here. We, uh, when we were asked to do this program um, a couple months back, we, we didn't know what we were gonna talk about. We decided uh, we would talk about how we were able to stay together as a couple, how to um, weather the storms of the fire service, uh, uh, bringing stuff home. And uh, we, when we thought about a name for it, we thought about the, our, our vows that we took for better or worse. And that, that sort of summed up everything. Um, and before we get to the introductions of who we are, uh, I know Michelle had a, uh, a disclaimer there at the very beginning. We also have a, a little disclaimer here. Um, something that we read anytime we go up and we speak because uh, we're gonna be dealing with emotionally charged subjects. Um, we're gonna be dealing with some mental health discussions and these can be really scary and sometimes dredge up um, old memories that you know you might have thought had been put away or packed up and put away. So if anybody uh, is sitting here and has any uh, emotions that are stirred up from long forgotten memories or, or something, and you find it overwhelming, we, we do encourage you to take a step back, take some long deep breaths, reach out to someone, let us know, uh, somebody on the call here for your peer support um, that you might need help processing. Because um, that's what this is all about is how can we process and how can we uh, continue to, uh, to be healthy. Um, next to a line of duty death uh, in, your, in your organization, we can't think of any other fire ground situation that is as stressful as a firefighter May Day. And what we hope to 
uh, convey to everybody here tonight that through the use of some actual fire ground communications of a mayday, um, personal experience of what happened to us, this will show you that these types of stressors and things that happen on the fire ground and within an organization, they uh, extend far beyond just the fire ground. This uh, goes to through your organization, to mutual aid organizations, and most importantly, to your families uh, as well. So with that, here's us. Um, I'm, my name's Sandy Kahn. I am a pediatric critical care nurse and I work in the cardiac intensive care unit um, at a very large children's hospital in Cincinnati. I um, started out my career the first 10 years doing neonatal intensive care and then have gone into the cardiac intensive care. With that comes, you know, um, a lot of children, family, um, issues and death, um, a lot of stress, codes go on all the time. So, well, I mean, being in the fire service can be very stressful. I also have a stressful job, so we have to lean on each other. Uh, I am Steve Kahn. I am a battalion chief for a, uh, a larger fire department outside of Cincinnati, uh, about 200 people on the department. Uh, I've been a firefighter for about 35, 36 years. Um, I've spent 30 years on the current department that I've uh, that I'm working for now. Um, and so, uh, in addition, not only do I have one stressful job, I'm also a critical care nurse, uh, uh, also, and I work in interventional radiology and cardiology. Um, so, it's one of those things that you know it, it's kind of hard to to put anything on the shelf. It's, you sound like adrenaline junkies. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think our, you know, what really defines us, we're going to be married 30 years next week. And, um, with that, we are, um, eternally grateful to each other for the way that we've been able to share our ups and downs, um, and, and get through to where we are right now. So it all started in the sunshine state, Florida. Um, I went to Florida with my friends. He went to Florida with his friends, and we met down there at um, EMR and, <laughs> and Fort Lauderdale, Fort so Lauderdale. in Michelle's backyard there. I guess. Exactly. Um, we had, you know, I in, uh, keep in mind this is in retrospect. Like we didn't know it when we were in it. We, you know, we know now looking back that we had a lot of ups and downs, and trying to go back and figure out what those ups and downs. So this it will give you perspective. You know, you can be anywhere in this timeline, you know, that we're gonna present over our 30 years. So it started in, um, you know, we were both in, I met him, he talked me into going to college for nursing. He was already in college for nursing, um, but we couldn't wait to get married. So we, while we were in college, we decided to plan a wedding and get married. Uh, we graduated a year later and we were both offered jobs out of state in a very small town in Indiana away from our families. So along with this, stress, 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 do you see any correlations? And we're just starting off our family. Um, if you ever look at the, the, the sheets from your you know, psych 101 and mental health classes, they look at the different life stressors. And let's see, college, wedding, uh, moving away, buying a home, those are all the top five and 10 of these life stressors. And we just continued to, to pound them in. We both were working straight nights, but Steve was working 12 hour night shifts. I was working eight hours. So he would um, lump his together to do six in a row and then be off for, you know, maybe a week at a time, whereas I was working every single night. So there wasn't a lot to do in the town. We, we moved from a fairly big city into a smaller town and you just have a lot of idle time. And we got pregnant shortly after moving out there. No idea how that happened. <laughs> um, a couple months after that is when um, Colerain called uh, Steve and said that they were gonna be hiring full-time career positions and they wanted him to come back and apply for the position. So uh, we finished out our contract with the hospital and we moved back to Cincinnati and had our baby. Um, and then I didn't, I had health problems after I had the baby. So it was a rough six weeks after delivering. And then um, 
we went ahead and um, bought a house because we needed something bigger. So as we're starting to, to grow our family, we're thinking life is perfect. We have a nice big house. Uh, we both have secure jobs. Me working career for the fire for the fire service. Um, she's working full time for the one of the largest hospital systems in Cincinnati. Um, we live close to uh, grandma and grandpa, so they they were able to um, to watch our kids. So we were able to um, go back and forth with that. Um, I got to deliver our baby girl, and everything was great. Everything continues to to grow, our family was growing and everything seemed right. But as with everything, you start paying attention to things that are that don't go right. The more you buy, you know, uh, you think that you can afford more because you get more steady income, but we still had all of our student debt that um, somebody charged their um, I charge, I, charge to a visa. Year, I charge a year worth of school on my visa. Um, I'm a firefighter. I'm not a financial wizard. We so. didn't know better. <laughs> um, our son was diagnosed with uh, ADHD and impulsivity when um, he started in elementary school. Uh, very difficult for me to kind of keep control of. And then our daughter, uh, when she started in elementary school, developed an anxiety disorder. We have no idea why, but I mean, it was it was pretty big for us because she would not go to school. She would scream and cry. I couldn't get her out of the house. She'd hold onto the doorway. She'd run away. I mean, there were times when he would have to come home from the firehouse to physically take her. And that always put the worry um, in your gut as to like, why, you know, is this happening? So, you know, you start getting involved with a lot of counselors from a very young age to figure out how to handle that. And, um, I guess real quick, um, you know, what we're talking about here isn't unique to us. This is, we, we know plenty of families that go through this, whether it's major health crisis with the child, school problems, ADHD and impulsivity. These are just stressors that every relationship goes through. Every parent goes through these types of things. So we're nothing, we're, we're nothing special from that. We just want to do a highlight the fact that we understand that everybody goes through this. Um, I was dealing with some problems at my own at my own workplace um, as a result of poor leadership with um, just the you know things just were up and down all the time bad relationship with the boss and you know that weighs heavily on you. I already talked about how stressful uh, my job was at the time this was like in the very early 2000s um, at this time my um, dad had gotten sick and started having strokes and the date of his first small stroke that he had was September 11th 2001 and so when you go back and you try and put all these things in like how did, how did we get where we are or whatever you start to go back and think oh my gosh like there was a lot that we had going on as if we didn't have enough going on and, and if, yeah, if we didn't have enough going on I thought we'd throw one more log on the fire and I thought I'd go back to school and start working on a master's degree. Um, you can see the, the slide there showing the piece of the Swiss cheese. All those holes start to line up, right? We know about the Swiss cheese theory. These are just holes that are starting to line up. When we get in these situations, I'm sure everyone's seen Paul Combs uh, cartoons before. The guy's incredible with his insight into capturing a feeling. And this is typical of any first responder, police, fire, EMS, dispatch, uh, first uh, frontline responders, our nurses, our doctors. We understand that we typically don't ask for help for ourselves. We're in the helping and caring profession. We want to help other people, but we rarely help ask for help ourselves because of pride. We tend to think that uh, we can help ourselves no matter what's circling around us. So I want to start off here with a May Day. We're going to talk about uh, one of the largest stressors that our family has gone through, uh, or the, the, the beginning of a, of a large stressor. And it starts back on March 21st, 2003. I was at the station one day and we hear Cincinnati firefighter uh, Oscar Armstrong uh, goes down in a, in a house fire. 25 year old Oscar Armstrong um, got caught in a flashover um 
I have uh, Sandy's brother um, was a captain at the time. Her other her brother's a lieutenant on Cincinnati Fire Department. We butt up against Cincinnati. This hit us right in the gut. The Cincinnati area hadn't had a line of duty death in, in a number of years. So this really checks, you know, it gets the gut check. Um, so that afternoon, I take my crew out in the bay. We do some practicing with some uh, of uh, firefighter safety and survival, some drags and carries and things. And we sit down for dinner thinking nothing else is ready to happen. Um, Andy was working an evening shift at the hospital. Kids are home with a babysitter. Everything, you know, we're planning on doing some work the next day to help Cincinnati with what they were going through. And we get dispatched to the structure fire out of my station. I was the first new engine. Uh, I was a lieutenant at the time, first uh, uh, company officer on the scene here uh, of this structure. We had a, uh, and looked like an attic fire. At about nine o'clock PM, I get met in the driveway by a police officer says he thinks people are in the house and we might have victims. So we make an interior attack. I had heavy involvement in the attic, but we did not do a 360. If anybody's been in the fire service for more than about 18 years, they realized that 20 and 30 years ago, we did not do 360s. We just sort of winged it, or we tried to get as many sides that we could see, and I went in. If I had done a 360, I would have recognized we had a basement fire. So I was crawling in right on top of a fire. About three minutes inside the house, this happens. Go ahead, all of you stand by. That's a stressful situation that that happened uh, at nine o'clock on March 21st, 2003. Um, I was able to self-rescue after my firefighter laid on the floor holding my hand down through the basement fire. Um, and what, what do you think happened after that? You know, I come out and I got right back on the rig. I went right back to work. I was right back to the grind. It was business as usual. Um, and this is where we need to address this in the fire service. And we are doing a great job of it. Um, 20, 30 years ago, the, um, the mentality was um, just suck it up, walk it off, and you're going to be fine. Uh, I had a boss tell me, uh, ask, what did I do to F things up? Obviously, I F something up to end up in the basement. My battalion chief uh, told me I was making a bigger deal out of it than what it really was. I just needed to shut up about it. You know, what happened to taking care of our own? If anyone's talked with Michelle um, and listened to her talk about moral injury, I think this is the basis of a moral injury. Um, I think it's PTSD afterwards, but I also think it's a moral injury is when you believe in something should happen one way and it doesn't. And something totally different happens. We need to address this. We need to make sure that we're not blowing these things off and we take care of our people. I didn't go to the hospital. I didn't get a medical assessment. I was right back in the firehouse that night. And I worked with this for the next couple of years with claustrophobia, started having sleep problems. I was gaining weight, stopped working out. I hurt everywhere. 
this is the commercial for depression when they uh from 10 years ago where does it where does depression hurt it hurts everywhere and every day he was like i'm in pain i'm in pain and the pain just becomes too much i didn't know what it was um oh and by the way i'm also working on a thesis for my masters remember those those holes start lining up um works busier than ever so we this is our comparison where he knows like what's happening to him but not really identifying with it but i knew that he was working more than ever he was picking up extra shifts he was working at the hospital because if you're working then you're not thinking and so you start running away from what your thoughts are by keeping your mind busy doing other things uh he began snoring and restless sleeping you know kicking his legs his arms his eating was out of control. Always went to the refrigerator in the pantry, open it up, thinking there's going to be something different every time you open it up. Something's going to appear that is enticing. Um, and then he kept listening to his mayday over and over. He called the commu communication center and got a recording of it. And he, when he was home, he would just sit there at the desk playing it over and over and over. And now I can only imagine it was because he was trying to figure out what did I do to mess up? What did I do wrong? Looking for you know, a validation that isn't there. Um, distant with the kids, um, you know. One of the things that we uh, we discussed after when we started doing some of these talks was, I sort of felt that in in you know, I, yeah, I, I hurt and I was I wasn't feeling great, but I thought it was okay. I thought you know I'm fine. I'll just get through this. This is just a rough patch. Everything will be fine. But what she saw was something totally different. And I just love these memes because my kids say these all the time. I'm in danger. Um, you know, but this when Sandy, when she looks back, she, she says she could see specific things that I thought I was fine and I was spiraling right down. And then um, Steve um, played for the bagpipe and drum corps uh, in Hamilton County, and he was a drummer. And they, he got a phone call and they uh, said, you know, hey, it's St. Patrick's Day. The Atlantis is looking for uh, some pipers and drummers to come down for this big tournament that we're having. And we need a drummer. And he's like, I can't go. I'm like, what do you mean you can't go? Like, this is my ultimate dream vacation. All expense paid to the Atlantis. Oh, we're going. He's like, I'm not going. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? I don't understand this. We, it didn't matter. We didn't have money. They were giving us money to spend every day on top of just taking us there. And so he didn't want to do that. And in his lecture, when he gets more into defining like PTSD and all that kind of stuff, you know, he makes a statement where he says, you know, half the time we were out, we were having a great time drinking and, you know, going to all the restaurants, but the other half of the time I was in my room crying and he was, I mean, in the room, pulled the shades, it was dark and he would just cry, not knowing why he would cry. And um, it came time to load on the plane and get back home. And then um, this is when he crashes and burns there in the Bahama airport saying, I can't do it. I can't go back. And I'm like, uh, that's not a choice. Like, we've got to go back. And he's like, I can't. I can't deal with any of those stressors. I'm like, well, there's no help here. I'm like, it just, you know, I mean, he he's emotional. He's having his emotional breakdown. And I'm like, I had a panic attack before I could get on that plane. Um, you know, my, my wife said some comforting words to me. She said, get your ass on the plane. We can't do this down here. So, you know, um, and, and I did, you know, if once you meet my wife, you don't say no to her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we were able to get home and she immediately got on the phone. And that was on March 15th. 2005, March 16th, 2005, I checked myself into the hospital. I was in the middle of a, a panic attack. I was suicidal. All I knew is that I hurt and um, I didn't know why. Uh, just a little funny story about that. They ended up putting me in the hallway in the, in the emergency department right next to the squad doors. And the very first squad that comes through are my own people. And I'm sitting there crying and one of the guys asked me what's going on and my wife says he's having headaches he can't sleep so the guys go right back to the firehouse say hey captain cons and with uh, he's got a brain tumor um, we don't know what's going on with him you know typical firefighters right um but 
at this point in time, I checked myself into the hospital and I was in there for about a week and Sandy stepped up. So, you know, I, I have the two kids. I'm trying to work and do all that stuff, but you know, where's dad at? So it wasn't unusual. He would go to Washington to the National Fire Academy. So we said, well, he's at the National Fire Academy. But, you know, trying to keep life normal for the kids and for um, uh, myself and continue with everything. And then, you know, what were we going to tell the firehouse? Because you couldn't tell, couldn't tell his bosses that he had mental illness. They didn't understand that. I mean, you already know that from the fact that they said, what did you do to screw up or anything? Yeah, in 2005, we didn't talk about firefighters having PTSD and you know, realizing that this job really does take a toll on you. And I thought his, his chief would laugh at me, but I um, contacted the union president and I marched into the firehouse, sat in front of the chief and said, Steve's off work. He's going to be off for at least two weeks. You're not going to ask any questions and you're not going to tell anybody anything. And they did. They honored it, which I really appreciated. Um, he got discharged from the hospital and Austin was already scheduled for a tonsillectomy and he couldn't handle going back to the hospital. So, and of course it was supposed to be a same day surgery, get discharged, but no, I come home, son has complications, can't breathe, got to go back to the hospital, got to stay overnight. Again, I have to do this, you know, um, and then it, all those other days, taking them to Boy Scouts, soccer and band, um, trying to keep life normal and as usual. You know, when uh, when she was doing all that and then I got out, um, I was just through my crisis situation, but I still had a lot of confusion and questions. What was really wrong with me? Why? Did, how did I end up here? Why me? I had depression, I had guilt because I wasn't there for my kid. You know, I'm supposed to be a rock. I'm a nurse, I'm a paramedic, I'm a firefighter. I should be able to be there when my son has the tonsils out. And I was too anxious. I couldn't even go to that. Um, we had a mountain of a time trying to find a psychiatrist that would accept new patients in this area. Um, and you know, things are getting better in this region. But, you know, like I said, in 2005, we didn't talk about or diagnose firefighters with PTSD. We only talked about vets having PTSD. Um, and these are some questions that continued for the next several years. Um, I was functioning, but I was medium level functioning. I was not high level functioning up until April 4th, 2008. Um, I will go back and say um, when he did go back to work, he had had a sleep study while he was off and, um, and diagnosed with sleep apnea. So he had a CPAP machine. That was the excuse like, oh, I was off because I had headaches. I wasn't getting good sleep. I have sleep apnea, but now I'm good. It you wasn't know? a brain tumor, so. No, and, you know, know, so we were still pushing the depression, like, under the rug, not acknowledging it, um, and trying to go about day to day. But and nobody would believe that he had any issues or problems, or, because he's a funny guy, and they're like, he doesn't have problems, and I'm like, he does. We, we hide stuff. Mm -hmm. um, April 4th, 2008, uh, my own department loses Captain Robin Broxham and firefighter Brian Shira in a catastrophic floor collapse into a basement fire. Um, I was on the scene that day. I was um, I was the public information officer for the fire department. My department had never been through anything like that, and I was immediately thrust into the the limelight of everything. So I had to I had to stuff all my emotions uh, to the side because I had a job to do. And I became hyper driven. I was focused. I was super focused. Um, let's, let's face it, I was important. I was the face of the department at the time, right? People were coming to me for information. So that's that all those types of things build you up. Um, we would go out to dinner and people recognized me. And you know, that's a, that's a, that's a huge, no, that's another weight to, to carry around with you. Uh, one thing that did help me out. Sandy came up to the firehouse um, on that day. I gave her a pen and paper and she started being my scribe because who else knew the way that I thought? And she stayed with me for the next two weeks helping out. Um, in addition to my buddy from, uh, he's in Virginia right now, Mike Tronimus. Um, I had those two as my scribe and my uh, assistant PIO, but they helped me through all this time. And one thing we noticed, if anybody's ever been through this, and this is kind of an anecdotal 
uh, observation, our marital relationship really was never better through the stress of this. Um, we had more intimacy. We had more, uh, we, we held each other more. We touched each other more. We told each other we loved each other more. Um, and when we finally talked to somebody about that, they said, it, when you go through something like this as a couple and there's the potential of losing one or the other uh, of your partners, you know, you want to get as close to them as you can. And it's, it's not unusual to have intimacy just really um, go through the roof um, in, in situations like this. But as with everything, after a couple of months, I started falling down, going down a spiral again because it can only last for so long. Um, but this time it was different. After things quieted it down, I could tell he was starting to feel inadequate again, feeling like a failure because he still had not written that thesis that, you know, he had been, you know, a master's program's two years long. We're now like in five or six, five years. or six years. And he just never liked this topic. Um, and he started to get into a funk and we um, had an opportunity to go on a vacation again um, down to the Carolinas. And um, he, we passed Mount Pilot and he says, you know, I just wish about the times like when it could be like when Andy sit on the front porch and playing the guitar, you know, the simple days. And I was just like, oh my God, you're in this funk again. And um, it, more fighting with my son, butting head um, and always having to be in the referee between the two of them. Um, and so when we were down there and you know, we had a beautiful house with a you know, house full of friends and everything, you know, he's sitting inside on the couch and I'm like, you know, what's going on? Um, you know, what, what is this? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. And so um, at work, I do a lot of root cause analysis to figure out to get to the root of why you're acting that way. And he laughs at it because I keep asking why, why, why? Um, you ask why five times for the same thing, you'll get to the bottom of whatever the heck the problem is. That's and and that's um, yeah, <laughs> and he had we had an epiphany that um, we realized that he had PTSD because he had never been debriefed after his mayday and falling in the fire. Nobody ever asked him how he was. And, um, and, you know, when, when he was in the hospital for the psychiatry things, and then we got out, like nobody knew how to deal with a firefighter after that. He wasn't a war vet or anything. And I'm just like, you know, that I know what it is. You're like, nobody ever recognized that. And I think that's what your thesis needs to be is how's your department doing after, you know, um, a made in, in firefighter death. And so that's what he focused and wrote his thesis on. And right there on the spot, I made him call the professor at the college um, from the house there. And they, they said, what can we do? And they were both veterans and they understood it very much. And um, he went back to the college and met with the dean and the professor. And he's like, I need to retake the class, but I can't afford to pay for it. And they're like, we'll put you in the class. We'll pay for it. Anything we can do to get you through. Um, so he did. Um, Actual picture of my graduation. <laughs> yes, we finally made it to graduation. Um, so, you know, as, as we're starting to get through some of that, we realize that we've been given another lease on life with our family. Um, and we have new beginnings. And again, like with all families, new beginnings, you also get new stressors. Um, so the kids move into... Um, New schools, the daughter's now in middle school. My son starts in the high school. They get new friends. You start worrying about, you know, are they hanging with the right people? And kids- yeah. Hormones. Horm kids, say that. Yeah, kids know more than their parents do and they start back talking and all that kind of stuff. You know, sports, they start getting more competitive. My son was in the band, he was a drum major. Um, and we had also um, started a new church at this time. And I think, you know, a lot of things are divine. Um, when Robert and Brian had died, um, Stephanie's friend that she played soccer with, her uh, father was a pastor. And so she would spend the night on Saturday nights and we would drop her off at the church. So we decided to stay for services. And, and then it was literally two weeks later that the death of the firefighter happened. And this whole congregation just came 
and surrounded us and touched us and prayed over us. It's like, wow, I've never felt this before, a movement like that. So we did stick with that church because we had a lot of support there um, with everybody in there. And um, my dad passed away um, in uh, 2008. So that was another stressor. My, you know, mom living on her own, trying to help her take care of a big house and um, making sure that she stays healthy. Um, um, so at this point in time, you know, we started utilizing some of the coping mechanisms, coping skills, and some of the stuff that we had learned through some counseling, because we had gone through periodic counseling all through, obviously through my hospitalization and, and all that. But um, our, our doctor said, quit being nurses, quit being, you know, you guys need to be parents and you two need to take dates together. So our doctor even wrote us a prescription for, you know, dates. Um, we purchased a camper and we started going around camping. We had family game nights and uh my my kids they wanted a weekly family meeting so we talked about this last month on this call yeah. about you know that um that's one way to help your kid um have family meetings I, as steve said i grew up in a firefighter family and our parent my we would have sunday meetings and um so we did that here and uh i have a priceless letter that my son wrote uh, he sent a memo um like the week before about next week's meeting and that he would be running the meeting and he didn't think life was fair because his sister was getting more than him. It will be read, you know, uh, at his, right wedding, his wedding. At his yeah, wedding. Sure. But, you know, those are things you got to cherish and save all along the way. Um, and then, you know, things don't get easier. When they get to be teenagers, they, the problem is to get to be bigger. Um, our son, you know, it's typical of teenagers to have headaches because of the hormones and these headaches and the pain every day and not getting any relief. We had him to all kinds of doctors, neurology and everything. They had him on so many different medications, but it le led to a serious mental health crisis that he had. And with that, you know, our, uh, he had to be hospitalized sometime and Steve couldn't be there for that because it doesn't you know, brings up all those things for him. Our daughter in, in middle school had a sudden loss of the te of her teacher and created more anxiety for her. And it's this constant knot and worrying in your gut, you know, are my kids gonna be okay? Um, and then it came down to, uh, I was at work, I was worried about my son, um, you know, and whether he was getting the right therapy, if, if things were going right or not. And I had a traumatic patient experience um, unlike any other, it was a code situation that went on for four hours and every person in the department was working on this patient and it came up to me, just snuck up behind me. like, are you okay? And I lost it. I, I had to get out of there and I couldn't go back to work. So I called the EAP, uh, for my hospital and I was connected with our angel who has been our therapist for like the past 10 years and she is a tough cookie and doesn't let Steve get away with anything. I'm scared of her. <laughs> um, uh, she looks a lot like uh, the young lady from uh, Modern Family. Modern Family. Uh, She's very so intelligent. That's why we use her picture on here. So, um, but this, this actually began a lifelong commitment. Um, she was helping us with some stuff, obviously um, just maintenance for our relationship but also helping out with the kids. Um, these types of things helped us to build this safety net. Um, and this is our big takeaway and what we wanna make sure uh, we're able to convey to everybody because this is something that was never presented to me uh, and, and probably most of you when you got into fire service or EMS or, or even as a nurse. You know, to have a spousal meeting uh, or a seminar to find out what our loved ones are going to go through. We have to start building that safety net right from recruit school. We have to talk to our new recruits and say, you know what, next week, I want you to bring your significant other. I want you to bring your wife, your husband, your girlfriend. Um, please, if you want to bring mom and dad, they have to understand what we are doing. So they can start to build that safety net. 
when you, when you go to the therapist, they're always going to start with Maslow's hierarchy. If you're in a crisis or if you're in a rut, you know, the first thing that they're going to start with is, um, are you drinking enough? Are you eating enough? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating the right things? Um, are you exercising? So, you know, it, it's important to have that hierarchy for yourself personally, but also to have it relationally. Relationally, if you don't have a good foundation built on trust, love, honesty, transparency, um, you know, you can't go to that next level of, of whatever it is for you. So, again, knowing that you need to work on these things is the safety net. Um, the, the muscle memory, the more you work on things. We, we go to a counselor and, and she'll give us homework, whether it's daily gratitude journals or um, uh, journaling, which I've never been a journaler. But, you know, sometimes it just helps just to sit there and write stuff and get it out of your head onto paper. But the more you work on it, the more natural it becomes. You learn to recognize uh, the signs and symptoms early on. Um, angry, uh, chemical dependencies, you know, living it up on the weekends, drinking it away, thinking that Monday's a new week and things will get better. And then you, you just get in this perpetual cycle that it's not. And identifying when someone is shutting down. Um, you know, we asked her to help us with this slide. What are the things that we you have taken us through? Because it's really hard to say, what have we learned all along? I mean, we're great now, but what were those things that you taught us to do? Um, and she's, you know, how to ask each other um, when we're having a hard day, but allow each other space. Um, you know, maybe we don't want to talk about it right away. Maybe we're going to talk about it tomorrow when I have more energy to talk about it. And then identifying triggers. Um, so, you know, uh, she went on to say, you know, some of the personal examples are, you know, you, we can be sitting there in session and we can have this desire to change, but doing it and implementing it, it can be really difficult. Um, and sometimes when it gets uncomfortable, you have to lean in and you have to try different things. And I mean, we're willing to share these things. It, it doesn't quit. I mean, we still struggle, you know, this month. And um, Steve's had to try different strategies. Uh, she's like, Steve, I've been telling you for 10 years to journal and you just won't do it. But, and he's like, you, you know, if, if I had an addiction or if I was an alcoholic, I'd go to AA or I'd go to these things. Like, where do I go to get help from my depression? Where do I go? And she goes, right here. And he goes, take me back to square one. And she goes, okay, it's Maslow's hierarchy. So you're going to do these things. So, you know, we write it down. I become his accountability partner. And I'm like, how much have you drank today? Because you, you just don't water. remember to do it. Water. 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 <laughs> Not alcohol. Water. And um, so we, and then, you know, force them to journal. Buy the journal. Sit down. You got to do it. It's hard to make yourself do it. But if you have an accountability partner, then you're like, okay, somebody else cares about me. And I should do this, you know, out of love. Um, it creates discord uh, if one of us is emotionally charged and the other one wants to wait to talk. It, that was more geared towards me, she said. I can get emotionally charged sometimes. Um, and when Steve tells a story, when we go to therapy, he tells a story from 10,000 feet, you know, just gives you the high level overview. Me, I'm like down in the weeds. And he rolls his eyes and he goes, why are you making those, you know, eyes when she's telling her story? about a work event or something like that. He goes, God, you talk with so much detail as evidenced by this presentation. And, um, and, and um, she goes, well, what I know about Sandy is when she needs to decompress, she can tell a story, regurgitate it in detail and let it go. Whereas you are still talking about the same thing for the past 10 years. <laughs> I, I hold a grudge. <laughs> Um, so it's helpful to know the root of where some of your behaviors come from. We've we actually have even gone back to look at our upbringing and how it affects some of the things in the way, you know, how we've gotten where we are today. And knowledge is power for me when I understand um, the way he was brought up, the way I was brought up. Oh, this is why he has some challenges with feeling inadequate. This is why what people said to him back in 1990, he didn't feel like he was good enough. So um, being deep, you know, um, you got to do that. Hard work leads to priceless memories.
you know, one of the things, like I had said uh, early on, you know, this, this stuff that we work on, um, we're, we're basically wrapping up the presentation here to show that the, the hard work does lead to priceless memories. You know, we've been fortunate to have uh, two great kids. They've uh, been pains in the butt uh, on more than one occasion. But, you know, you know, as, with kids, they bring so much joy. We, they're getting older. We're, we're, we're turning into friends at the same time. In addition, um, we take them on vacations. We go places with them. Uh, and they're 27 and 24 years old. Um, but we still find time, like you see here in the bottom right, to go out just the two of us. We find time to spend a weekend together. We take a, we, we'll take the camper and we'll go down to Gatlinburg or we'll just, we might even just go down to the park, you know, half hour away. But we find time to be together, just the two of us. That's what creates and maintains that healthy relationship. So the results of our commitment, here's our son, Austin. He just graduated with a uh, bachelor's in cybersecurity engineering. He's working for a government contractor, has the dream job of a lifetime. He met uh, Catherine, she's uh, an RN. She's a structural heart coordinator for a uh, large hospital here in Cincinnati. Uh, he proposed last year and they're planning on getting married in June. And our daughter, Stephanie, uh, she's also graduated. Her kids a little bit longer to get a four year degree. Um, but that's okay, patience, you, you know, confidence. It, Took him six years to get his four-year degree. Um, she is uh, also a pediatric nurse at Cincinnati Children's Hospital in the uh, critical transplant unit and um, very close uh, with her boyfriend. Um, he is a lieutenant in the um, Marines, Brian Kurtz, and we hopefully will be seeing them get married soon also. Yep. And one more person in the uh, in the family, That's the, the boss. This is Riley J. McFinnigan. She is an unlicensed uh, independent social worker. She thinks she's a therapy lap dog. Um, she has no innate canine instincts at all, but she's what keeps us grounded. So she is a good girl. Yeah, she um, cars with us. <laughs> <laughs> she beats me. Yeah. So thank you so much to Michelle and the Florida Firefighter Safety and Health Collaborative for allowing us to come here and to present. Um, we know it was very structured, the, the talk, but um, what, what we want to make sure is everyone knows that, you know, this is a journey that we both took, that we've been through together. Uh, we continue to work every every day and we are not unlike every single one of you out there with your relationships um but we this is how that, we did it we hope that this offers you inspiration and hope um you know it's, life's a roller coaster and being in the fire service is very hard um but you just got to go along for the ride enjoy the wind through your hair and keep believing that it can be better so with that thank you very much and i think that's about it michelle Thank you so much for your willingness to share your story. Uh, more importantly, the uh, the Mayday call. Uh, I know for most of the first responders, at least in this room, it's a heart grabbing kind of moment. I even looked up at Michael and like patted my chest. Like, yeah, that was intense. So thank you for sharing that. Um, what a difference you're making for all of us. Um, we're still recording. I know I have some follow-up questions. Uh, most importantly, does the dog know she's Irish or is it we're not telling? I, her? I don't understand her. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, but uh, that said, um, I know I have some questions and certainly if anybody else has some questions, please feel free to type them in the chat if you'd like them to remain anonymous. Um, come off mute and ask them or you can wait till we stop recording. Um, I think... Um, one of the first things I'd like to point out, um, when we talk about the PTSD and first responders, you brought up some amazing points on things that spouses can be looking for. Um, what is one of, do you know what one of the first signs of the development of PTSD are in first responders, just for an educational standpoint? Any guesses? Do I know? Yeah. Or anybody? Anybody but you. <laughs> anybody. Uh. Irritability. 
very close. So the very first sign as a spouse um, that you can kind of sit back and notice is actually an increased jump response. So where your spouse may not have had an instant reaction to things, all of a sudden there's a jumpiness, almost like when you see a flash go off with a baby and they, they have this jerk effect. Um, this is one of the first signs that we can notice for PTSD, along with all of the other amazing signs um, that, that Sandy was intuitive enough, intuitive enough um, to see in Steve. So thank you for sharing that knowledge with people. Um, Sandy, you make this look easy. Um, I'm, I'm nervous as heck. <laughs> no, you, um, you were such a, a pillar of support for Steve on his journey. Um, no doubt behind the scenes, we didn't get to talk about all of the things that you were going through emotionally. How has that been for you? Have you sought treatment, um, you know, as a spouse? What, you know, what was that for you? I, I guess that's the best way I can ask that. Well, I knew from, you know, with the kids, it's like, you know, my son, you know, it was funny when he had ADHD and um, impulsivity, we took him to the first visit. And then the doctor from that point was, okay, you don't need to bring him back. I just need you two to keep coming back. And we're like, what are you talking about? He goes, you need to know how to parent a child that has impulsivity and ADHD. And pointed out, you know, quite a few things. Like Steve's like, hey buddy, can you take your shoes upstairs? You know, they're sitting on the steps. And he's like, no. He goes, you asked him a question. He's allowed to say no. You have to parent them differently. So, you know, and he, that doctor, at that point recognize you have a lot on your plate. And then, you know, my daughter, and then we got to go through counseling with her. Um, and that becomes a whole new thing. So I was exposed to it through um, that um, my kids, but I was telling Steve when we were preparing for this, even early on when we moved out to Indiana, um, we were struggling with our marriage. We were dated for four years before we got married. And then things weren't great. I couldn't sleep. I went to the sleep doctor and he's like, marriage isn't all bliss, is it? And I'm like, no, not really not. So we got a therapist out there. Well, and I mean, let's call it what it was. You know, she was working five nights a week. I was working two to three. You know, there was a bar that opened up as soon as I got off work in the morning at seven o'clock in the morning. You know, a couple of us would go to the bar. You know, that creates issues. Yeah. Um. So, you know, my co fellow co-workers and stuff like that are like, you guys go everywhere together. Like, you like each other. Like, why do you hang out? I'm like, we like each other, you know? And so the success to 30 years of marriage, um, we've had numerous counselors along the way. Like, I uh, I like our particular therapist now because she, she meets you where you are. And not every therapist that we've had most of them along the way were very short lived because they're enamored by him. They're like, oh, like you work in the fire service. Oh, you're Steve Kahn. Oh my God. And you can't have that. You, you need somebody that's going to cut through his bull and just hold him accountable. Sorry. And so, um, <laughs> so it, it, it um, but yet she notices every little twitch and, and reaction. So you, like we said, you know, you don't ever recommend, you know, one therapy for somebody. You just have to keep trying and working at it to you find what works for you. And there is no, it's not a one-stop shop. We do a lot of different things. He does a lot of things for me. I mean, he um, went and got a body wrap like last month with me. And he's <laughs> just like, you know, how, how manly is that? Sorry, everyone who knows me, <laughs> it was the most manly body wrap you can ever think of. It was full of mud <laughs> and weird. Yeah, we got it. We got it, Steve. <laughs> so, for the visual. So, you know, he never reached out to his EAP. It was me reaching out to my EAP. So sometimes I think the spouse needs to take, you know, the horse by the reins and direct it and take control over it. Um, if your insurance and everything is through your husband's fire department or your, your uh, uh, wife's fire department, um, the, it doesn't matter who calls the EAP. It doesn't have to be the employee themselves. Anybody can call. And I think this is this highlights what I know Michelle has done with Florida and what Ed Von Lemden is doing up here um, with our groups in vetting 
regional EAPs that, that, that understand the first responder mentality. We don't think like normal people, right? So, you know, EAP is wonderful for certain things, but really to get someone who really understands that first responder, frontline responder mentality is unique. Um, and that's why you need programs like what we're working on. Um, and we're getting better. And you couldn't be more right. In Florida, we have the clinician awareness program that's ramping up here again. And um, I've spoken with y'all and Ed about the redlinerescue.org project. Um, that is a nationwide project that links first responders to culturally competent um, clinicians and peer supporters. You, you couldn't be more right. Um, streamlining it and walking into a room where people are not just enamored with the stories that a first responder can tell, um, um, but moreover are not going to cry when we talk about our meeting call or, um, you know, in Dustin Hawkins case, you know, um, have a clinician that says, oh, can I touch your scars of your burn? Like there are things that we can be um, helping our clinicians to become more culturally competent in. So um, you couldn't be more on the nose with that. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, and I'll type the Redline Rescue um, information in the chat box because everybody, not just in Florida, um, it's run through UCF is welcome to sign up for this free resource. So um, I know the Reynolds brought up a really good point. I'm going to pass it to them for a second. Hi there. Um, we've been married for 20 years in July. So that's pretty awesome that, um, to hear another success story, even through all the hardship that you guys have been through. Um, what I, what really just jumped out to me so much with your story was there was just so much, so many things that were, and I think because of the line of work that you're in, I'm an interior designer. I don't respond to fires or life situations, but my husband does. But what I hear is a lot of taking on more than is necessary because as a firefighter, you can't say, well, I'm not gonna go to that call or I'm not gonna go help that patient when you're a nurse. So I think that there has to be, we have to learn to add balance into our life so that we, we have to learn to say no. It's so critical and, we don't, and you don't get that option at work. You don't get to say, oh, no, I'm not gonna do that. But in your life, you, you have to, otherwise it'll eat you alive. That's and a really uh, good point. Absolutely. Creating boundaries um, yeah. and knowing when enough is enough. Um, yeah. You know, when Steve started this um, three years ago and doing his national talk, I mean, he went to 10 different cities like in the first 18 months and then we went down again and the therapist was like you know you're taking on everybody's emotional burden listening to their stories mm -hmm. and it's weighing you down so he you know there's times where he has to send it to ed and like i can't i have to have boundaries you know i mean i think everybody feels it and now I, I just love so much that this is really in the forefront uh, for everybody and, and destigmatizing it because um, through our stories, everybody will realize that those are stressors. And while you think you're helping other people, it can be hurting the ones closest to you. Right. And I think even as um, parents too, we have to learn that you know, we do want to have our kids be happy and fulfilled, and but we can't do everything for them too. You know, if we have more than one, one kid and you got two kids wanting to go to two different directions, you have to say, you know, I'm sorry, we can only do one activity and you guys have to agree on what it is. And that's how I grew up. You know, I had three sisters and, oh, what are we doing this season? Oh, we're all doing dance. Okay, great. We'll all go on the same day. You know, so that my mom wasn't completely stressed trying to get us all in different places at the same time. So I think that as heroes and rescuers and first responders, the tendency is I can do that. I'm superhuman and I can do it all. And I think that we t the, the first responder mentality takes on too much. And so learning to say no is super, super critical. That's a very good point. Right. Um, I, I did want to point out that, you know, I, I'm kind of critical of the way my leadership of my, of my organization treated me after my May Day. Um, I can't apologize for it, but I do have to at least do a qualifier that that's the way we treated each other. 
you know, we're talking, that's 2003, that's seven, 18 years ago now. Um, actually, it's 18 years ago this month. So that's the way we treated each other. They weren't, we know now, but that's what we did back then. We have learned so much about how to do an after action report after any close call, after any near miss. We do after action reports now. My, my administration now, because of the way that the fire service has evolved and, and partly because of you know, me coming forward, um, my, my organization now actually gives me days off to go out and do this talk. So you know, they embrace this because we're doing good work. Uh, the peer support, I, I can't tell you how, how that has been a game changer in being able to talk to guys on crew, maybe the mutual aid department next door, someone will call you and say, hey, that run sucked and you know about it and you can help them out. Uh, that, that didn't happen 20 years ago. That, the, the peer support is a game changer. Um, if you don't have a peer support program in your region or in your area, I highly recommend um, there's a couple different templates out there through like Duke University. We went through the IAFF. Um, find a peer support model and, and work with it. It's absolutely incredible. What a great <clears throat> endorsement of peer support. Um, I, oh, you have a question? Go ahead. Hi, Steve. Hi, Mike. Can you talk briefly about how the experience that you had with your um, administration at work changed you as a boss for your people? That's a great question. How did, the, how did my experiences or what I experienced, how did that change me as a boss? Um, I worked for a boss that it was just he and I for uh, a number of years, we were the only career guys on the shift. Um, I have no idea what his kids' names are. Um, and it was 24, 48 for a couple of years. Um, he kept everything to himself. He didn't share any personal stuff with, with anybody. Um, that's the way he got into the fire service. I got into the fire service watching my brother-in-laws and the way that they would, uh, their, their crew would show up at the kids first, uh, uh, at their first communion or their baptisms. And the, the whole idea of a family, that's what I wanted. Um, so when I was treated like that and with no personal regard and no follow-up and finding out how I was doing as a person, I made it my own personal uh, uh, journey uh, to, and challenge to not let that happen to my guys. I try to be engaged in my guys. I don't want to go on vacation with them, um, but I want to know what's going on in their lives. I want, I want their wives and husbands to be able to call me if they notice something going on. Uh, I've had that happen before. I've reached out. Um, in my talk, I, I show a couple of slides where one of my firefighters had, in the course of about six weeks, he had like nine absolutely critical traumatic uh, DOA entrapments and burns and stuff like that. Um, I reached out to his wife, let me know how he's doing. I don't know if I'm legally allowed to do that stuff. I don't care. I think it's the right thing to do. So in, in that in that respect, Mike, how has it changed me? It's changed me to care about my guys. Um, and my guys know that I love them. Um, I hate them sometimes. I hate them all like brothers, right? But you'll do anything at all for your brother. You still love them. And that's the way I, that's the way I try to uh, treat them. I was you know, even a kind of acting in the father figure. So a couple things I can think of like Mother's Day. They, you know, they're all working on Sunday, Mother's Day. He's like, invite your wives up. We're going to give them a breakfast. And so in the Bay, they set up tables. They put sheets on them. They went to and bought uh, some flowers at the store and they made us breakfast. And we came up to the firehouse and we all, you know, got to see our husbands, on, you know, and bring the kids up. So doing little things like that within your own firehouse also, you know, builds relationships. I appreciate you sharing that. I, I, I kind of, I kind of figured that you were going to say something like that. <laughs> the, the family. Just note the smile, by the way, it's happening. The and I would also <laughs> like to say, he told me he'll explain what a communion is to me later. Yeah. 
the, uh, <laughs> the family appreciates when you take care of the responder, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I had, <clears throat> I had plenty of significant others that expressed that to me. And I wanted you to share that because it means a lot. And Thank you. Yeah. I, for being that person. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you have some of your guys um, attesting to that in the, the chat right now. Um, well, we're still they, on the board, so I don't want to call out names, but um, they think that I'm going to pay them, is what it is. <laughs> no, they want to go on vacation to uh, Atlantis. With the <laughs> They're asking me to Venmo them some money now, I guess. That said, I know you went through a Mayday call. A lot of first responders in this room here have been through significant calls. Maybe not a Mayday, you know, hopefully not a Mayday, but. Um, I know we have a lot of couples on this call this evening. We have the Hayawakes, we have the Reynolds, we have um, little, little Miami up there, Big Miami, acknowledge that Little Miami is on the call this evening, um, Ed. And so I, I'm just, I, I'd like to toss it out to those of you willing to speak um, while we're recording. Um, how, is, how have significant calls, how has um, loving a first responder made you as a couple um, stronger? How has it tested you? You know, any of you who are willing to share, we'd love to hear it. All right. I'm actually down here in Florida. You just said it's not really Florida, but I'm in the panhandle. Alabama. Alabama. Go ahead. All right. I'm, I'm in the panhandle at a, uh, at a conference and Amy's home uh, taking care of the rest of the house and Living all the other the crazy things that we, we have going on. Hi, babe. Hi. Nice to see you. So it's, uh, I've got a new, uh, I got a new position. I got promoted to a battalion chief back in December. I've been acting, I was acting in the position for a couple months prior to that. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say there's been a critical incident stress moment, but it's just a new stress moment. And I know that Amy's definitely had my back with what's going on with, uh, changing of my role from a captain to a battalion. And that was definitely stressful for me. And I'm still, I'm still in the learning phase and I'm going to be in a learning phase for a long time, but that's definitely stressed us a um, little background for us. We have five kids, so we can't play man to man. We got to play a zone and we've time. got now kids all the time. Yeah. We've got kids down in Florida, Connecticut, uh, Jersey. Uh, so we we're from Jersey uh, anyway, but it's, little things just pop up and it seems like once we get over the initial hit of whatever that is fire fire or issue that's going on with them we get closer um we may handle things differently amy is definitely the yin to my yang i am more of the knee-jerk reaction kind and she's more of the longer fuse type and it, uh, it helps out. If she wants me to fix the problem right away, I'll give you an answer. But she's the one that will chew on it and mull it over. Um, we had something that went on with our, our daughter regarding landlord-tenant stuff. And then we're like hang, uh, trying to handle that. And it's nice to see our, our daughter's 22 right now. And she's it's nice to see her sphere. Oh, 23. So, <clears throat> it's okay. It's fine. It's great. It's just recording. It's fine. Okay. I, heard, I heard 23. How about you? <laughs> Maybe finish up the story. Anyway, no, it's just lovely because so she is actually in the police academy and, uh, you know, she just graduated from college this June and was hired on the job August 31st up in Connecticut. And it's so lovely that she called and she had an acute issue that we could somewhat play a part in handling, but she has this other support network within the law enforcement community that has picked her up and is like, this is what we can do and we can do this and we can do this and we can help you and we can do this. And it's so lovely to see sort of the first responder group absorbing our kid and what's going on. And, um, you know, it's a huge dynamic change for us. Um, and to be honest, you know, in our house, John is sort of interdependent of us when it's a work day or it's the day after or the day before because uh, his job is um, really good at taking advantage of his ability to answer the phone. I think that was like the nicest way I could say that. Um, and so we just, you know, sometimes we have to remind him that there are civilians in the house. They could be little kids. They could be my kids' friends. 
you know, they could be just normal peers, but, you know, accountants don't talk about the things we talk about at our dinner table. So, you know, that's something that we try to keep in mind and we try to keep in mind, you know, that our 10 year old is listening, you know, and our, our older kids are, in my opinion, better for having a first responder for a dad because they have incredible compassion to others and they're very aware of situations to others. And they're very thoughtful to what they can do to make someone better. That being said, um, you know, day after station is very difficult for us. And it's, you know, especially after a call or after a fire, you know, if we could, if I could have like some sort of, you guys, if you could order this for me, some kind of like red light that will show up that says, you know, please don't talk to John today. Just, you know, because he's come home from a bad shift, a bad fire, you know, as battalion, he's in charge of two houses. He's basically like the conductor at fires that keeps people safe. And he is, he takes his responsibility very seriously. So my job as support staff, because I don't work outside the home anymore, um, you know, is to make sure that he's got room to breathe. And then I go fill my cup independently. Like I do talk to somebody to make sure that, you know, I'm processing stuff appropriately and it's not about me, you know, cause like it's not, you know, That's, so. It's um, one of the things that has helped me though. I'm also talking with somebody independently yeah. of Amy, of Amy's person. So um, I think it, it's helped me out a lot because I was learning, I was burning the candle at both ends in the middle. And I think a lot of us in the first responder uh, group here understand that totally. And uh you know, I, I was there at that one time a couple of years ago and I'll, I'm back again with just trying to figure out different coping mechanisms and skills with different stressors. Um, and anybody that's an officer here will, uh, will understand. I'll take a fire over the administrative paperwork and craziness that comes, that comes at you. And, you know, it comes at you not, not slowly. It's new. You're, you know, trial by fire. And I'm learning my, I'm learning my ways, you know, I'm, I'm making, I'm making some waves and, you know, the waves are coming back. So I'm, I got to learn sometimes, you know, again, it's a new thing, but again, Amy and I have things, uh, we go out and we have our staff meetings. Staff meetings. Yeah. Um, that's our, our time to get away. Kids don't like meetings. If they know we're going to the store, they want to come. And uh, we used to say we were going to the store, but then we never came home with groceries. So they were kind of, they kind of caught on to that. So we can't do that anymore. So we try and we try and at least get it one night a week. It's a little more difficult. Um, COVID times. New COVID Jersey's still times. locked down. Don't come over to play. We can't play. Don't do it. <laughs> so uh, it's it was definitely difficult. Uh, 2020 was a was absolutely a wreck, and that's a whole nother story, and we won't go there. But uh, we uh, we struggled through. Uh, but we did it, babe. We're on the other days. side. Yep. So we're moving. We're moving through. But uh, again, it just brought us closer. Uh, the further we, uh, the further apart we were, uh, literally for a couple of months because of being sick, and then figuratively with traveling and stuff. Now that things are starting to back uh, back open, and I'm more I'm more at work now it seems than I've ever been, especially as a, as a new uh, new chief. But um, we try and get closer. Try and do the little nightly routines, you know. She likes it when I touch her feet with my feet at night. When 100%. We're going to That's how I sleep best. Yeah. Just, the dog those, is just, just not the same, the, sir. The now, idiosyncrasies, you know. Now you know why I love the Haywick so much. Because they're <laughs> so down to earth and relatable, just like the cons. And um, we know that those bugles are very hard to carry, John. We're so grateful you're doing that in Passaic um, for the community of Passaic Chief. Um, but, uh, and thank you more importantly for sharing your willingness to share uh, both here and on your own individual podcast, which you're welcome to share in the chat box for everybody. Um, but um, to hear that you take what could be a weak weakness and turn it into strength to grow together is inspiring for everybody here. Um, thank you for your willingness to share. Um, anybody else um, willing to share any of our couples? Um, before I turn us off the recording, because if not, I will turn us off the recording and, and we can definitely um, have a very confidential open conversation. I will say one, I want to say one more thing. Um, one thing we don't do is try to therapy each other. Um, 
we there's been times where she'll try to throw that critical conversation terminology at me and ask me to share my mental model with her and all these different things. And, you know, and I'm like, don't psychoanalyze me because I lose all the time. But if, if, if you get into that, that, that habit of trying to fix everything for each other or where you're psychoanalyzing it, the, the, your, your relationship isn't there. That's why we always go to somebody else. We go to that neutral party to unload some stuff because um, it, we just realized we, we can't help each other out in certain things. You know, we're there for each other. We are supportive uh, on everything. But I sometimes she doesn't want to hear what I have to say. Sometimes I don't want to hear what she has to say. So we get that neutral, uh, that neutral third party in there and she can fight against me. <laughs> and there's no shame in that, right? Having that neutral third party. I did it with my ex-husband. He lives with PTSD. Um, and now I've got, you know, this one and um <laughs> it's uh it's it's okay to need some outside help sometimes um and i'm grateful um that you were willing to share that you seek that there's no shame in that more importantly even if you didn't want to share it no one ever has to know that you did seek that out outside help it's completely confidential so um so thank you for sharing it um I don't know if any of our other, anyone else has questions or any of our other couples want to chime in. If not, I'm going to take us off um, the recording, but I hear someone coming off mute. Reynolds, hello. All right. Well, we just had recently had something kind of happen. We were watching this show, which we highly recommend, by the way. Um, it's signed, sealed, and delivered, and it's on Hallmark. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, but it was Reynolds, a- I'm saying I won't tell anyone on your department, I promise. Uh, yeah, don't tell anyone we watch it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, we have a 10 year, we have an 11 year old, so everything needs to be very, you know, easy and, you know, nice and safe. So um, anyway, we, it was a episode about a Afghanistan encounter, you know, overseas kind of thing and the whole deal. And it, it was very, I, I don't have the experiences he has. And all of a sudden I'm looking over and he's breathing heavy. He's breathing hard. It's like, he's like in the battle or something. And it's, it never, you never know when it's going to happen, you know? And, uh, and I think that really the biggest thing in, in that whole psycho don't psychoanalyze it. And I, my thing is just be, I, all I could do is just be there for him. You know, I let him kind of walk off and have his moment, but then I came in gently and just held him because that's all I can do. And I think that we need to not discount just the simplicity of not saying a thing and just being there for each other. Um, because that's really someone, I feel like someone like that, someone going through that doesn't want to feel alone because they, they're having this experience, but they probably feel very alone in it because no one else knows what that feels like um, at that moment to them. And so um, I think that was probably something, it was happened two weeks ago and you never know. And it, it triggers things like his several fire calls he's been on that have been very, very bad, just terrific loss, just awful, terrible things. And you just never know when it's gonna happen. Very so. true. Very, very true. When we were, um, Rachel, when we were talking with the cons about having them on, um, it was, it was them and Michael and I were sitting on a zoom and, um, Steve was telling his story and it, and, you know, it triggered, it triggered Michael. Michael's a retired deputy chief and he had a moment where he just needed to walk away. So it, it definitely does happen. Um, what, what I feel like is most important to state is, um, that you were supportive. Um, we spent two thirds of our life with our families. And yet uh, we don't, a, a lot of us first responders are guilty of not allowing our families to be that peer support like Steve was talking about. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm grateful we have this forum and the ability to say that it's okay not to have the right thing to say, but just to just be there and listen. You, you don't always have to have the right thing to say. It, 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 it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, the ability to um, be vulnerable with someone you love and still have that person love you after your vulnerability is, you know, that moment has passed is huge. Yeah. So, you know, I applaud you for allowing Shane to have that moment. Um, 
and just being there to listen and giving him the leeway that he needed to feel what he was feeling. Yeah. So, um, but everybody needs a person agreed. and, you know, and we're each other's pe people. And, and, you know, I, you know, if I see someone crying, the tears are going to flow. It doesn't matter if it's on TV. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a good, like, you know, I can be a good wet blanket with you. I can, <laughs> I can just cry and I can, I can, I can really try and be as present as possible. And I can barely talk when I'm crying anyway. So we'll just cry together, you know, <laughs> um, but it's, but on the other side of it, you know, he can talk about it then, but I'm not asking for him to talk. I just want him to do, be him. So that's, I think, really important too. Amazing. I love that. Shane. For the record, um, everybody, I, I don't cry and I don't watch Hallmark. <laughs> so I'm actually a very hard man. Yeah. So um, tough. But one of the things that I feel like I've learned over the years in uh, marriage and in leadership, and I just finished 26 years with my department. I'm very, very blessed to be gainfully employed for all these years and be able to be in public service has taught me a lot about the human condition. But I'm, I'm a better friend to myself. And when I have those moments when I might be triggered over something, and I really hate using that word triggered, but yeah. everyone understands that. I, I realize that if I need a moment, I take a moment. I used to be try to be the tough guy and think, oh, I need to power through this, or I need to act like I'm under control for appearances. And I'm much better to myself and just Senior taking a minute, being honest and original and realizing I'm a human being, that I'm really not as tough as, um, as, as you know, the, the hero complex that we put on. And uh, I realize that the more that I do that, the more I, I'm that in my marriage and I'm more like that in my management and, and leadership on my fire department with people. Um, oftentimes we get into a situation difficult situation with employees or a crew and um, they might be snarling like dogs at you or something and you feel like you have something brilliant to say because you're a chief officer and the fact is that you really don't and you shouldn't feel that pressure and you should be willing to take a, a minute and gather your thoughts and be more more confident with what not to say versus saying something stupid because you felt like you had to say it. And that could be said in marriage and with your children and with yourself, but we just really don't, we don't seem to get any good at all this stuff until we get a few gray hairs on our head. And uh, that's sad, but it's true. But uh, I would wanna say that I, I love all of you and I really appreciate, I'm encouraged personally by all of you being here. And I think it's a wonderful thing that we we have in the collaborative. And, and so thank you and I'm gonna, I'm going to shut up from there. We're grateful to have you guys as part of our family, as always. And uh, again, so grateful to see you back at it, happy and healthy, most importantly at home. Um, just to restate um, and, and kind of back up what you said, someone wiser than me once said, uh, we're, we're in the, the business of people. And at the end of the day, we are all just that people. Some of us have chosen to take the next step in order to promote but um, we all put our, you know, our, our clothes on the same way in the morning as everybody else. And um, the more we understand that um, rank does not define what leadership is and that um, leadership really is being able to turn around and see who's following you and, and to take care of your people like Shane has talked about. I'm going to cry. That's not fair. Because <laughs> I've been through my own things in my own department. So um, to have leaders like you out there who care for people um, is inspiring and refreshing and um, definitely gives me the passion and drive to continue um, what we do um, in the collaborative and, and what I do as well. So um, thank you for sharing that um, and uh, grateful to, um, to have you again as part of our family. Um, I saw, um, I saw Kelly O'Dare, my spirit animal. I'm going to digress to her so I can deal with the lump in my throat. Suck it up, buttercup. Uh, suck it up, buttercup. This is, this is what happens when, when you date someone in the same field as you. Um, Kelly O'Dare and Brandon Wilson, again, second alarm project up in the panhandle. Uh, I'm grateful to, to know Kelly O'Dare. First of all, I believe that everything happens for a reason. 
Um, Kelly is a fire wife uh, and, and Kelly's uncle or father figure from what I've, I've learned um, was a line of duty death from my department. Um, I've had some great conversations with her and, um, and I believe that we've, we're connected for a reason. Um, so I'm gonna pass it to Kelly and then Brandon because Brandon has a very prolific sense of humor. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll start <laughs> with Kelly um, and, and welcome both of them to talk. Thank you. Thank, and I just want to say, of course, thank you to Michelle for doing this and to the collaborative for providing this forum for all of us to be here this evening and, and working together. And um, thank you to the cons so much for your story tonight. Wow. Um, just fantastic story and um, really enjoyed listening to both of you tell your story and Thank you for sharing your, your Mayday call. That really definitely put, put a chill down my spine. I almost texted you, Michelle, during that just to kind of share a moment and say, wow, I, that, that really meant a lot. And thank you for sharing that. Um, so I think that, you know, as I, I have an interesting role because I'm a firewife myself and I also do the work of providing behavioral health services to first responders. Um, so it's really interesting. I feel like I have a little bit of knowledge in both sides of the equation and, and sometimes it all comes together and makes sense. But most of the time, I feel like I'm just trying to figure it all out like everybody else. Um, but a couple of the things that I've noticed as, as spouses and as family members, we really need resources and supports too that go above and beyond information about how to spot signs and symptoms in your first responder. I mean, that's a great place to start, but um, you know, I think that having support systems there for us to be able to get our needs met as well is really important. And so a couple of the things that I heard tonight that I really, think are so important is that um, each of you that have shared have said that you have someone that you can go to that's outside of your spouse, that's outside of, you know, the, your first responder organization. And so I think that's incredibly helpful in making sure that our families stay safe and our families stay stable is that your wife, your husband, your significant other, whomever that support person is for you has their own support network too. So that way if they're suffering, if they're going through their own stuff, which, you know, look, we're all going through all of our own stuff. Even those of us who seem like we've got it all figured out and who are the strongest ones, we are all going through all of our own stuff, especially now in the midst of COVID and civil unrest and everything else going on. Um, we just, we really have to take care of each other. So making sure our first responders are supported, yes, very important, but also making sure that we have operationalized way to take care of the spouses and family members is, is very important. Um, you know, in Firewives, I, I'm in this category myself, so I'm certainly not taking any pot shots, but we're, we're a tough crowd, man. I mean, we're a really, really tough crowd. And I know that many of us would rather watch our firefighter fall on his proverbial sword before we would be comfortable with them acknowledging that, hey, maybe they aren't the tough guy, maybe they need help. So I think some of us as firewives need some help to kind of to lose that stigma that we have in our own homes of what this male gender role and the expectation is that it's okay for them to not be okay and that it's okay for them to ask for help um, and, and, you know, just that it's okay. And, and so some of the hero culture, you know, chimes into all of that. Yes, they're definitely our heroes, but it's okay for them to be able to take the cape off and, and take a rest when they need to and, and recuperate. And again, given my background, um, you know, I, I'm still guilty of that myself. And I've, Brendan and I have been together for about 10 years and I was with him right as he started fire school. So I've been with him all along the way and I knew what I was getting into being from a fire family myself. Um, but there was one incident in particular that I remember where I realized, you know, holy crap, I think I know what this is all about, but I really don't. Um, it was kind of early on in his career and he went to 
a very tragic call where four children uh, died in a fire and he was on the scene of that fire and he got off shift that morning and came home and I, I looked at him when he came home and I could just tell something was different about him. But we also try to not therapize each other, especially me with him. You know, we have, he's got his people. I've got my people. We've got our people together and we just leave it as that. We, we talk about a lot of stuff, but we just don't try to therapize each other. And he looked different that morning that he came home. Um, and I had a really important event for work that evening. And my expectation was, is that he was just gonna, you know, take a shower and, and brush it off and he was going to be completely okay. And he was going to be able to come to that work meeting with me. And it was important to me and I needed him to be there for me. And I really didn't see the bigger picture of it. And, and that was really a light bulb moment. Um, it took a little while for that light bulb to go off after that event. Um, but it did. And just recognizing what had happened and what he needed, given what he had just been through. And for me to be able to, to um, you know, have my needs but to be able to see that, okay, he's, he's not going to be fully there at this really important work meeting with me tonight. And there's been other examples of that over the years, but that's just one that, that really sticks out to me. Um, but at the end of the day, I learned recently a, a tip that I think has been really helpful to, to Brandon and I through this process. And um, he's my best friend and I can't imagine, you know, doing life with anybody else. Um, and you know, love kind of waxes and wanes, especially after you've been with somebody for five years or 10 years or geez, 30 years, I imagine you go through ebbs and flows, but I like him. I like, I'm in like with this person. Not that I'm not in love with him. I love him too, but I really like him. I like spending time with him. He's my best friend. And, um, you know, we, we just were told not too long ago that sometimes, you know, you need to have more of the like, because the love waxes and wanes. But if you truly like this person and you want to spend your life with them, then you've got a, a pretty good um, compatriot. So that's kind of our deal. And I'll leave it there. I like how you um, shared that um, I, I can appreciate you know, the situation where he is coming off a shift, you know, and he's in a bad place, but your day still has to go on and you still have responsibilities. You know, so we just went through that with COVID back in the fall and we were getting ready to go on a camping trip. And so the camper was in the driveway. He was not feeling well at all and was, uh, had gotten tested. And then I wasn't feeling well, went and got tested. He got a phone call. Yeah, you're positive. And I'm like, oh, we can't you know, we're not going anywhere. And I was negative and my daughter was negative and she was a senior, you know, trying to get her clinicals done. And I'm like, I hate to say this, but you're gonna have to move out to the camper. I mean, like it's there, it's practical. Um, and he liked it the first day, second day, he could get the internet. He could watch everything on TV out there. But that third day he, you know, he now, you know, can verbalize and he goes, I'm really struggling. I'm really lonely. And even though hey, we're right here, but just not being in the same space, you know, like take him food to the door, talk to him and stuff like that. But I knew he was really struggling and I had to go to work. So I called on everybody. I called his Lieutenant and I'm like, Hey, you guys get to run this way. Swing by, say hi. I called his parents. I called and I texted other people and I'm like, you know, can you jump on FaceTime with him? Because I, I knew he was in a, had a bad day. So, you know, reaching out to other support people so that you don't worry and they get what they need, um, recognizing it. And then who can you call on? It doesn't always have to be me that fixes it. Steve, I can totally understand that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, unfortunately... Uh, I think we talked about this on the Unlock Your Culture podcast. You were there. Um, Mike and Michelle were my were my safety net when I was sick back in March, April, and May. I actually did 45 days of being sick uh, of COVID, and probably 40 of that was isolated in my bedroom and getting food handed to the door with a mask and gloves. And uh, it, it was rough. 
you know, that was, that was a real stressful time for Amy and I, and that isolation really played with my head with that. And to this day, there's still some COVID PTSD that I've got. And I was fairly sick, um, pneumonia and all that other good stuff. And I knew I couldn't go to the, uh, the hospital. So I went to the hospital and I wasn't coming out and I was going alone and that was it. So we, right. we, we made it work. We, uh, nebulizer treatments and everything else, every six hours, it was crazy, but you know, Amy was, Amy was my rock and took care of me as best she could. And Mike and Michelle were my mental rock because they were calling me every other day uh, and checking on me. So that, that was really cool. And that, that helped out so much. We were so but, lucky. Uh, to have I understand that isolation network. thing. Yeah. We had such a great support network when he was sick. You know, there were people calling from all around the country just to be like, what are you doing? Like, what are you watching? Are you okay? And, you know, it, it took a little bit of burden off of me because when he was sick, I don't know where everybody is on this caught call but when he was sick it was um like the wild west still here he got sick the end of march so you know um it was still very fear-based there wasn't any reality to treatment or protocol or you know anything else it was like you know if you cough in the grocery store then three aisles over somebody else could get sick it was yeah. just a terrifying time and and we were all scared and you know the department of health was like all right well if he's positive assume you guys are all positive and stay inside till he's better and we were like I'm sorry, what? Like, because six of us were home. My one daughter was in Connecticut, but everybody else was home. And we stayed inside literally for a month. Like, finally, like the boys started going for rides, but they didn't get out of the car, you know? And my girlfriend, I'd lice all my credit card and she would go shopping. And like the mental toll of all of that is insane. Like, and, but I at least had the benefit of moving around my house. You know, John was in our bedroom for months. Like, it was so difficult. It was so difficult and we still deal with the after effects of that you know just to try to make sure everybody's okay and you know is this reality or is this anxiety because we were sick you know where where are we doing here and it's not always the easy answer it's still very fear-based in new jersey all these months later and it's it's uh it's really depleting there's no other word for it it's just depleting sure. amy yeah, i have to say i have to say amy that uh when you said the Wild West, it's exactly how I felt when he was sick. Uh, we were, I felt like we were out there with no help in the wind and no one knew anything. And it was, oh, just take some Tylenol. And it wasn't doing anything. And he had 102 fever for 10 days and it was really, really bad. And I was super scared and I knew if I took him to the hospital, I wasn't going to see him again. Exactly. And we it was were terrifying. Gonna... <laughs> we're in a we're in a small town in northwest New Jersey. It's you know more rural, especially than where he works, which is you know outside of Newark, New Jersey, which is so it's pretty urban. But um, nobody was sick here yet, and the doctor was like, "Well, you know, if you really think he has it, I'll just write him home for two weeks." And I was like, "That's not a thing. Like, there's something really wrong." And I I pulled in every favor I could, and called you know a lady who actually was a surgeon of mine that became a friend. And she was like, bring him to me. And I brought her to, I brought him to like the general population tents outside of a hospital. And she like plucked him from our car and brought him inside and got him tested and x-rayed and became his doctor and put him back in my car. And if he wasn't x-rayed, we never, we wouldn't have known he had pneumonia until it was wow. really bad because uh, if anybody knows anything about pneumonia, it didn't look like pneumonia to us. It just didn't look like it. It was, you know, he was fine. Like we've got an asthmatic in the house. We know what duress looks like. It wasn't duress. You know, his stats would be like 86 and he's watching deadliest catch. And I'm like, I'm on FaceTime and I'm like, what, what, what do I do with this? Like, how do I fix this? What do I do? And yeah. the mental mind, I won't curse, but the mental mind mess of that was something that, you know, I'm still dealing with. It's, it's, well, yeah. it's honestly what, broke me enough to go get care for myself this fall. Cause I just couldn't get, I couldn't, I, you know, I can't speak for anybody here, but I've lived, you know, and, and I know where my threshold is and I know like where I'm at and, you know, if I'm okay and, and I wasn't okay. And I was super anxious and I was acting out of turn, how I typically respond. And, you know, John's right. I have the longest fuse in the universe, you know, five kids will do that. And I was snapping all the time and I was afraid all the time. And I just, I needed to go put my feet on the ground and I couldn't go to him for grounding because he was still messed up. No offense, babe, you know this, 
you know, like he had to, he had to carry his own weight. He had to find his own way. And, and I didn't live what he lived and I don't have the responsibilities he has. And my imagination can't bring me there. So, right. you know, my job is to run my house and to set my humans up for success. And I couldn't do it. So yeah. I got, I had to get help. And Michelle was actually really great about, you know, like where your limitations are and, you know, where superhero status occurs. And like, I wasn't there. Like I just, I just needed a break and, uh, and I needed to understand that like, it was okay that this threw me for such a loop, you know, trauma does that. And, you know, and no one around here to this moment has been sick. Like my husband was sick. So, you know, there's very few people you can talk to and just be like, this sucked and have somebody actually be on the same page as how bad it was per your imagination you know so he got sad yeah, yeah definitely well Shane went from you know, having zero blood pressure issues perfect we just the week before he got sick they had a health stat at work all his blood work was perfect so now he's got high blood pressure you know and all just just like that and you know where he has you know gone to the doctor to have treatment for that specifically and it's just so disheartening because I felt like we were just so abandoned and so you're just on your own and and it's a very scary place to be and yeah. I think that the thing that got me through was his dad and mom are very close to us where they lived down the road and they you know called every day and they let me cry on the phone and talk to him because he couldn't listen to me cry he couldn't, you know, he was in there suffering, you know, hundred percent. And so, you know, we, I'm so thankful that I had the support system of my parents and his parents, but we were all locked up in the house too. We, we assumed we were sick as well. You know, there's and, not a house and, big enough for that. sis. So yeah. And, and we, we didn't, you know, we, he went in, uh, in his room whenever he wanted to, but we, we just figured we're all going to get it. You know, we didn't, you know, I was secretly watching Hallmark films. <laughs> that was what he was doing in there. <laughs> just saying you beat me to it. He wants to watch say, Christmas movies. That's what it was. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say, Shane, you should really try a body wrap. <laughs> <laughs> he was in all my spa products. <laughs> yeah, so it's it, it was definitely scary. Um, and I don't know if anybody knows besides Mike and Michelle and obviously Amy. Um my department had the first line of duty death of COVID. It was Izzy Tolentino. Um, he was number 25 last year of line of duty deaths. And I was sick because him and I had coffee every morning that I go to work. What, and did, I you, got it. Wait, what did you have with him, John? Coffee. Coffee. Shared coffee. pot. Yes, coffee. You know, coffee. So, but, but that's, that was the craziness. It was so new and nobody knew anything. And I got to give Amy props because none of our kids and her, none of them got sick. She was cleaning like a mad woman, Lysol, everything. And, but again, uh, you saw, I'm still dealing with that. Uh, that's why I talked to uh, my therapist because talking about this still gets me choked up because of everything that went on. And it's, it's one of those things I'm trying to work on because it had such a profound impact. So, and I feel like first, I feel like first responders do so well when they know like what they control and what they can't. And this is like the most not able to be controlled thing. And even among medical professionals, there's such a variance of, you know, what can go wrong and what did go wrong and what the after effects are. And everybody's like, I don't know, let's study you, you know, and, and that's not helpful. We trust the medical professionals to give us grounding agents and there's nothing to be grounded by until like, you know, 20 years from now when they ask our kids. That's it. I am grateful to be a part of your tribe and um, the Reynolds and the, the Haywicks and uh, willingness to share the, um, the life adventure that you've been through. Um, John, I only called you because I need something. So I'm only kidding, buddy. Yeah, I'm uh, making <laughs> that phone call for you. Yeah. No, I, I was grateful to be um, there for you. Uh, both of us are, I can speak for both of us. He's playing with the dog, but um, um, you know, that's, that's what family's about. Um, it's more, it's so much more than just a spouse. It's, it's, it's what we do as a culture. Um, and so, you know, that said the ability to connect with Amy and, 
um, get to hear her story. And I was so grateful that I got to send her a gratitude journal and brought her a gratitude journal and, um, you know, um, you know, that their family is willing and open to, to whatever it needs to, to build towards a healthier family has been a blessing to be a part of and, and to watch. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I know Ed wanted to share something and then I'm, I'm going to cut the recording off. I feel like two hours of recording is great. And I t even texted uh, Chris Bader and was like, look what we built. So I'm really excited. Um, if Ed is there. Hey, Ed, did you want to share? Hello. Something with us? Hey. Yeah, you can stop the recording if you want it. That's okay. fine. Go ahead. And then <laughs> Go ahead. I'm not a big talker to begin with. No, I just want to thank you and all the Florida group, you and Kelly of, of everything. Uh, three years ago, Steve and I had no idea what we were going to get, get into, and, and we knew we had a serious issue. We had three deaths by suicide within a short period of time, and um, Steve volunteered to go out and tell his story to the local agencies around the county, and that was very, very difficult. It took a lot of courage, and every time he did, you know, after the, the the talk, we would get phone calls within 24 hours of needing assistance. So we've had about 200 contacts and um, 50 in outpatient services in the last two years. So I think the numbers speak for themselves. And, and the May Day call, when we get a call from a peer at two, three o'clock in the morning um, and needing assistance, that that it's just like a regular May Day call, like, you know, we have to do. And I always tell people, doesn't matter, you know, what, what agency you work for, you get a call at three o'clock in the middle of the night for a hangnail, you're going to go out and you're going to make that person stay a better day. Uh, but to build the trust and, and to ask for the help when you need it, it's it's tough for us. I mean, that's just not what we do. So to try to, to develop that, and again, I appreciate everything Florida's doing and allowing Steve and Sandy to share their their experience and because I, I hate talking publicly. So, <laughs> but well, yeah, I can thank you. Attest to the amazing job that you're doing to build um, not only peer support networks out there, but to change the face of what leadership is in Ohio. Um, this is this is not happening because of Florida or anything that I've done. What's happening is because of everything that you're doing out there and willing to share. And I just have the blessing of experience to have created a platform to allow you to share it. So um, to all of you, to John, to, to Ed, to Shane, to Steve, to Mark, to everybody who was on this call this evening, I can't thank you enough, um, Kelly O'Dare, all of you for um, being a part of our family, no matter where you are. Um, to the cons, thank you for your willingness and vulnerability this evening. You are definitely improving the lives of those around you and have created um, what I had to cut off at two hours. You've created a, a two hour recorded conversation amongst um, people from across the country. Um, you're an inspiration and um, very grateful to have you as part of our family. So with that- um, Thank you very much. We it's, love it's, this is so humbling. I mean, I, I, I'm overwhelmed at the numbers of people we had on here today. Um, good conversations. Uh, it, means the world to us. Thank you so much. And thank you. Um, so for, I know Ed has seen it in Steve's talk, but you know, the talk that Steve gives is just him. I'm in the audience and then people end up asking me questions. So this is the first, you know, time that I've actually sat next to him and given my version of it. So I appreciate it, but his story is very impactful. Um, and it, it is just like for the fire service, you know, the language that you all talk, you know, all that kind of stuff, but i uh, very proud of him um, from where he was to how far he's come. And um, he put in the work. He deserves it. He wouldn't, Thank you. Thank you. He wouldn't be him without you, Sandy. Um, I, <laughs> I told you, that to, to, to Kelly the other night, I guess is, is her husband was over listening to the conversation. A lot of us would not be where we are, um, including myself, <clears throat> without the love and support of somebody behind me. So um, thank you for, <clears throat> thank you for your uh, vulnerability this evening um, and to everybody who are sharing. 
I am going to stop the recording and, and then we can go out in conversation. We look forward to seeing all of you next month. And um, thanks for being a part of the family. We'll see you then.